7.3 separable equations. So far we have examined differential equations geometrically through direction fields. We would also like to approach differential equations symbolically, that is we would like to have an explicit formula for a solution. This is not always possible, but here we examine a type of equation that we can solve explicitly. A separable differential equation can be written in the form dy dx equals g of x times f of y, meaning that we have some function dependent on x times some function dependent on y. To solve this equation, we write it in differential form, and what I mean by that is we have to get all the y stuff on the left, so we would get 1 over f of y dy equals, and then get everything else on the right, g of x dx. So now that we've done that, in this form, the variables have been separated, all the y's are on one side, and all the x's are on the other, and now you integrate both sides, so just take the antiderivative of both sides. This equation implicitly defines y as a function of x. In some cases, we may be able to solve for y in terms of x. So let's do an example. We have dy dx equals x squared over y squared. So let's get all the y stuff on the left and everything else on the right. And so now we take the antiderivative of both sides. The antiderivative of y squared is one-third y cubed, which equals one-third x cubed. And we can just put the c on the right-hand side. We don't have to put it on both sides because we could say like plus c here and then plus a different c here and then say this was c1 and this was c2. Well, c2 minus c1 is some other c. So we just always put the constant with the x. And let's multiply everything by 3. Let's just call that our c. And then we would get y equals the cubed root of x cubed plus c. And we have an initial condition that says y of 0 equals 2. And so y of 0 is equal to the cubed root of 0 cubed plus c to the cubed root of c. So we know that the cubed root of c equals 2. Let's cube both sides. And we get c equals 8. Therefore, y equals the cubed root of x cubed plus 8 is our final answer. Here's a graphical interpretation of our solution. We knew that y is 0 equals 2 was our initial condition, so we have a family, and we know that this one is our particular solution. based on the initial condition we were given. Solve the differential equation, dy dx equals 6x squared over 2y plus cosine of y. Again, get all the y stuff on the left, and all the x stuff on the right. Take the antiderivative of both sides. The antiderivative of 2y is y squared. The antiderivative of cosine is just sine. The antiderivative of 6x squared is 6 times 1 third x cubed plus c. And so we have y squared plus sine y equals 2x cubed plus c. And in this one, we can't actually solve for y explicitly. So that's all we can do. And that would be the solution curve. And we don't have an initial condition, so we don't know what our particular solution is in this case. Solve the equation y prime equals x squared y. So we could rewrite this as dy dx equals x squared y, all the y stuff on the left, everything else on the right. The antiderivative of 1 over y is ln absolute value of y, 1 third x cubed plus c. 
So let's go ahead and just do e to both sides. And so we get absolute value y equals e to the one-third x cubed times e to the c. And let's just call this c1. And so we'll say y equals c e to the one-third x cubed where c equals plus or minus e to the c1. Remember orthogonal trajectories? An orthogonal trajectory of a family of curves is a curve that intersects each curve of the family orthogonally or at right angles. So in other words, we're saying that the tangent lines are perpendicular there. For example, each member of the family y equals mx of straight lines through the origin is an orthogonal trajectory of the family x squared plus y squared equals r squared of concentric circles with center the origin. We say that the two families are orthogonal trajectories of each other because if we take the tangent line at the intersection point, they are perpendicular to one another. So here's just another picture because it's pretty cool. Okay, so let me go ahead and prove what I was just saying. Let's actually find the orthogonal trajectories of the family of curves given by x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So again, in order to find orthogonal, I need their slopes to be negative reciprocals of one another. I don't have a slope here. So let's go ahead and use implicit differentiation to find that. So 2x plus 2y dy dx equals, and r is just a constant, so its derivative is zero. So we have 2y dy dx equals negative 2x dy dx equals negative x over y. What is going to be orthogonal? We take the negative reciprocal. So dy dx would be equal to y over x. So now we need to separate the variables in order to find our solution curve. So in order to do that, I'm going to put all the y stuff on the left and all the x stuff on the right. So if I put the y over here, I have 1 over y dy equals 1 over x dx. And so now... I can take the antiderivative of both sides. The antiderivative of 1 over y would be ln absolute value of y equals ln absolute value of x plus c. To undo the ln, I'm just going to e, base e. So e to the ln absolute value of y is going to give me the absolute value of y equals, and I'm going to break this part down into e to the ln absolute value of x times e to the c. I can do that, right? Because remember that a to the x times a to the y is just a to the x plus y. So I kind of undid that right here. That was my rule of exponents. And so now I don't want the absolute value of y. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just say y equals a e to the ln absolute value of x where that a is going to capture plus or minus e to the c. So by saying that a equals plus or minus e to the c, then I can get rid of that absolute value of y, right? Because that's capturing that it could be positive or negative, because the absolute value of a negative number is positive and the absolute value of the positive number is positive. So I capture that in my a. And so now e to the ln is just a times the absolute value of x. So that is what I had proved right here that for each straight line the family of orthogonal trajectories would be concentric circles with center at the origin and so now I just went the other way around. So this is my illustration of it. Pretty cool. Find the orthogonal trajectories of the family of curves x equals ky squared, where k is an arbitrary constant. And so orthogonal trajectories would mean that the tangent lines are perpendicular to one another. So we better first find the slope of the tangent line. So in order to do that, we need to find dy dx of this equation.
The derivative of this side is 1, and the derivative of this side, the constant k, times 2y, remember every y has a baby, dy dx, because y is a function of x. And so when we solve, we get dy dx equals 1 over 2ky. However, what is k? We want something in terms of x's and y's. What is k? Look at the original equation. We have x equals ky squared. In other words, k equals x over y squared. So let's just use that to get dy dx equals 1 over 2ky or 1 over 2x over y, in other words, y over 2x. So what are our orthogonal trajectories? We have to take the negative reciprocal. So they'll satisfy dy dx equals negative 2x over y. But I didn't ask what is the slope, I asked find the orthogonal trajectories. So now I need to find the equation that satisfies that. So I'll just separate the variables and I'll get y dy equals negative 2x dx. Take the antiderivative of both sides. We get 1 half y squared equals negative x squared plus c. In other words, x squared plus 1 half y squared equals c, and if you notice this equation, those are a family of ellipses centered at the origin. And we can see that in our next slide. The tangent lines are perpendicular to one another at every point of intersection. That's what orthogonal trajectories mean. Mixing problems, we might see one of these, we might not. There's applications and basically you just have to look at the equation. But just as an overview, what is a mixing problem? A typical mixing problem involves a tank of fixed capacity filled with a thoroughly mixed solution of sub substance such as salt. A solution of a given concentration enters the tank at a fixed rate and the mixture thoroughly stirred leaves at a fixed rate which may differ from the entering rate. If yt denotes the amount of substance in the tank at a time t, then y prime t is the rate at which the substance is being added minus the rate at which it is being removed. Because here we have something going in and something going out. And so y prime is just the rate at which a substance is being added minus the rate at which it is being removed. The mathematical description of the situation often leads to a first order separable differential equation. So that's just a typical application that we might see, but again, it's nothing to memorize. You just have to work through the problem once you get it. This last example is kind of cool, but a little bit messy, I'll just warn you. When a raindrop falls, it increases in size, and so its mass at time t is a function of t, m of t. The rate of growth of the mass is km of t for some positive constant k. So this is saying that the rate of growth over time is k times m. When we apply Newton's law of motion to the raindrop, we get the derivative mv prime equals gm, where v is the velocity of the raindrop directed downward, and g is acceleration due to gravity. The terminal velocity of the raindrop is the limit as t approaches infinity of v of t. Find an expression for the terminal velocity in terms of g and k. I forgot to see. So what do we know? We know dm dt is equal to km. In other words, m prime equals km. They also tell us that mv prime equals gm. What is mv prime? Well, both the mass and the velocity are changing over time. 
So that derivative requires a product rule. Remember the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second? And we know that m prime equals km, so let's just do a simple substitution there. And I think we're pretty safe to assume that the mass wouldn't be zero, so we can divide everything by m. In other words, v prime, which equals dv dt, is just gm minus kv. And so let's go ahead and just separate our variables there. Let's get all the v stuff on one side and everything else on the other. dv dt equals g minus kv, or 1 over g minus kv dv is equal to dt. I'm just going to write 1 dt so we don't get confused when we go to take the antiderivative of both sides. The antiderivative of this requires a u substitution. So I'm just going to do that up here. So let's let u equal g minus kv. And so du is just going to be negative k dv. We don't see that there. We just see a dv. So I know negative 1 over k du should be substituted in for my dv. So this is just the antiderivative of 1 over u times negative 1 over k du. Let's just pull that constant out. And so we get negative 1 over k. The antiderivative of 1 over u is ln absolute value of u plus c, which is equal to negative 1 over k ln and u was just g minus kv. We know this is equal to negative 1 over k ln absolute value of g minus kv equals the antiderivative of 1 is just t plus c. Let's just multiply both sides by negative k. We get g minus kv equals e to the negative kt minus kc, which means that g minus kv equals a e to the negative kt, where a is equal to e to the negative kc. So what else do we know? Uh, we know it's beginning at rest. So since beginning at rest, we know the initial velocity is zero. So let's go ahead and use that. We get g minus kv, which is zero, equals a e to the negative k t, and our time is zero here. So we just get g equals a times one, g equals a, therefore, g minus kv equals our a, as we know g, kv, just putting it on that side, equals, put that on that side, g minus g e to the negative kt. We could factor out that g. And so what does v equal? v just equals g over k times 1 minus e to the negative kt. And now we're almost done. They asked us to find the limit of this. So what is the limit as t approaches infinity of this? Well, e to the negative kt. As t goes to infinity, we've got to remember that the graph of e to the negative x looks like that. So we know that this limit is just going to be zero. And so the limit of gk times 1 minus 0 is just g over k. And so that is our answer. And we're done. That's it for this lesson.